Hello, everybody. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the executive director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. And I have to make sure I'm wearing my, I'm not a robot, and it is checked, so I'm not a robot. This is a live person talking to you. We have a great class today. Thanks for coming to session six. The title of this session is Different Mix of Techniques for Skills-Based Seminars or Large Classes. We have three excellent speakers with us. We're so happy to have them. Our first up will be Renee Nicole Allen. She's an assistant professor of legal writing at St. John's University School of Law. And she's one of the most recent members, uh, or she's, she's part of our most recent fellowship on law school success. Um, in spring 2020, she taught legal writing. Following her will be Mary LaFrance, the IGT professor of intellectual property law at UNLV, William Boyd School of Law. She's been a member of three Cali fellowships. She's authored lessons in copyright law, trademark, and patent law, and in spring 2020 taught uh, intellectual property license and entertainment law, speaking as a large class, speaking to the large class perspective. And our closing speaker will be Brittany Raposa, associate director and professor of bar support at Roger Williams University School of Law, distinguished teaching professor of the 2019-2020 academic year, she teaches the mandatory in-house bar prep course that students take in their third year, as well as the second year skills course. And in spring 2020, she was teaching a seminar when the school moved to remote instruction. So with that, it's all up to you, Renee. I hand it off. Great, thanks, John. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks all 296 of you who are here. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and while I'm doing that, um, I'm starting my presentation as Two Truths and a Lie, um, Reflections from Teaching an Online Skills Course. Um, so, Deb, if you will put the poll up, I'm asking Two Truths and a Lie, if everyone will highlight the lie um, in my own reflex reflections from the spring semester. And I'll give everyone some time to do that. I think the lie is pretty obvious. Deb, maybe you can let me know when enough results are in to kind of move on. Absolutely. Still watching them come in. All right, um, John. I'm not certain. Um, I, I can I can end the poll. I no, I know how to end it. I don't know if people are seeing it. Um, there, I was seeing it, but I had already answered it. So oh, go okay, ahead. okay. Well, yeah. um, Renee, uh, let me tell you what the results are then, because I'm not sure if you're seeing. What? Yeah, if um, oh, Hi, you're I'm back. back. So 81% okay. of the people voted, so I'm assuming they can see it. Um, and then, uh, so I'm going to, I'll take over. Um, so Strange, strangely, I can't, I can't see it, Elmer. Uh, I mean, I'm logged in also as a student. Yeah. Well, 80%. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Thank you. And then, um, and then we'll share the results. Thanks. There we go. And now we we're see. sharing the results, so everyone should be able to see the results. All right, and I can see them too. So it looks like the majority of you um, were able to correctly select the lie. Um, the lie was that I did everything right and there were no mistakes. Um, the other two things are true, and I'm going to use these two truths and a lie um, to uh, make the framework for my talk today. Um, so before I do that, I want to give a little bit of background about uh, what I teach and what how my spring um, online uh, went. So I teach legal writing. There are 38. There were 38 students in my class this spring. My classes went online in March, which means I taught five two hour online classes. My online presence included lecture, formative assessments, student presentations, individual conferences and or arguments. 
Um, and I think full disclosure is warranted here. Last August, I completed a fully synchronous online master's degree in educational psychology. So while I had not taught online, I certainly had a, a good bit of experience with synchronous online learning before this spring. Um, and I had a good idea of, of what it meant to be a student in an online classroom and what worked and um, what didn't work. So um, on each slide, I'll be giving you um, some tech tips and tools you might think about using in the, in the fall if you're going to be teaching online. Um, on this slide, there's a picture of me um, where I've turned myself into a cartoon. Um, and so some students, um, I think photos will be particularly important if you are teaching in a fully synchronous classroom in the fall if you don't have the opportunity to engage with your students in person. Um, and so Institune is an app where if a student doesn't feel comfortable sharing a photo of themselves, they might feel more comfortable making themselves into a cartoon. Um, Institune is free and it allows you to do that. And so um, here's one of my recent Institune photos. So let's start with the lie. I did everything right and there are no mistakes. It's an absolute lie uh, and I, I could spend my whole 20 minutes talking about the mistakes. Um, instead, I think I'll just say you will make mistakes. So it's a good place to start, accept it. Um, I think the biggest thing with mistakes, particularly in a synchronous online classroom, um, is to you have to acknowledge the mistake. So you can't teach around a big elephant in the room. If a mistake happens, um, you know, with your plan for using technology, um, you have to just acknowledge what's going on. So accept that you will make mistakes and then acknowledge them. Um, one thing that helps with mistakes and technology in a synchronous online environment is if you are able to narrate what you're doing. Um, so in my synchronous classroom, um, I often would say things like, if you see me looking off to the side, it's because I only have a laptop at home and I'm using my iPad, which is propped up next to me for notes. And so I'll be looking from side to side periodically to check my notes. It lets your students know that you're actually tuned into them and you're paying attention to them, even though your eyes um, might stray away from the screen. Um, and then be transparent, I think, about if you're starting or trying something new. Um, so if you're going to try some new tech, say, hey, uh, we're going to try breakout rooms today in class for the first time. I've practiced in advance. I hope it goes well um, so that students know what to expect and they're able to kind of set their ex expectations accordingly. Um, and then last but certainly probably not least and probably the most important thing on this slide is don't overdo it with tech. Um, I've been to a ton of presentations in the last month that I think are excellent, excellent that were excellent, and I've learned about a lot of different tools um, to use in an online environment, but you can't use all of them. Um, and you're bound to make mistakes if you do. Um, so don't overdo it with technology. Pick one or two things that you want to consistently use in your classroom this fall um, and develop a tech routine. Um, so everything will be new. Um, some things will be new to you, but everything will be new to your students this fall. Um, allow them to develop some familiarity with the tech you're using by using some of the same tech tools um, and developing a routine. Um, in this slide is my Apple Me emoji, um, Samsung and other devices. There's all kinds of Bitmojis and um, software that allow you to use your own image to create an emoji. Um, I found emojis particularly helpful in the spring um, when we first transitioned to online um, I, to gauge how students were coping and how they were feeling. Um, and so, you know, not many of them told me directly with words, um, but I got a lot of emojis that gave me a sense of how my students were handling the transition to online learning. So this may help you gauge um, where your students are um, not necessarily with their learning, though certainly you can use them with their learning, but I used emojis really to get to the heart of how they were feeling. So switching to the truths, um, my students seem to really enjoy synchronous, um, su synchronous learning supplemented with some asynchronous content. Um, I used Prezi, this slide um, presentation is a Prezi, and this is one of the slides from an audio supplemented um, presentation. So Prezi, just like PowerPoint, allows you to record audio on individual slides. 
Um, I did that to supplement one of my classes. Um, one of the things that I think if you're going to create some asynchronous content you want to be conscious of um, are things like page numbers. Um, so when I created this slide, I was not thinking about the fact that I might like to use asynchronous content on an ongoing basis to supplement some of my in-class teaching when we return to teaching in person. Um, but I put the book in and I put the page numbers in and those are things that might change over time. Um, so I'm going to redo a lot of um, the asynchronous content that I created for the spring. Um, and my focus in doing that will be to focus on the things that don't change, like the standard of review, um, but to leave page numbers and specific book references out of my slides so that I can continue to use these asynchronous tools um, for years to come. One of the things that I like about um, these asynchronous tools in Prezi is that Prezi has um, analytics and tracking features that allow me to see when students have logged in to watch the audio slides and listen to the audio slides um, and how much time they spend on each slide. So I actually can gather um, whether they fully listen to the slides or if they just gone in and click through the slides um, without paying attention. And so in addition to this kind of summary overview, I have a line, there's a line item that gives you each student's name. Students have to log in with their um, email address um, and they're able then to track their progress so I can award attendance or give credit for their time spent in this asynchronous learning activity. Um, Prezi, by the way, um, is, has a platform for educators that I believe is $60 a year. Um, I know schools have, some schools have institutional relationships with Prezi. Um, so if it's something you're interested in using that you're not already using, um, you might check out and, um, whether your school has an institutional relationship with them. The other way I supplemented my class with asynchronous content was with Prezi Video. Um, Prezi Video allowed me to take my slide platform that my students were already familiar with, but um, throw my face in it um, and add in some talking points along with the slides. Um, what I did with this particular video, because there is no tracking mechanism for Prezi video, is that I, the video had a corresponding um, assignment that was due on the discussion board of my learning management system. Um, so this year I use Blackboard Ultra. Uh, my school is currently transitioning, transitioning to Canvas. Um, and so I'll be using Canvas in the future for discussion boards, but there was absolutely no way that students could complete the assignment without watching this video. And I very intentionally put the instructions and the details about the assignment throughout this 15 minute video, which required students then to watch it all. Um, something that I like about the Prezi video is that students do have the ability to watch it on um, an advanced speed. So I think this goes up to three times speed. Um, and so it's up to them how they watch it. I'm not monitoring or tracking that, but it is important if there's no tracking mechanism that there's some correlating um, assignment if you need to keep attendance um, for these asynchronous or keep time, track time and attendance for these asynchronous classroom activities. Um, one good thing about Prezi Video for accessibility purposes is that it automatically generates a transcript. Um, and so, and that transcript hangs around on the actual video so students always have access to it. If they watch the whole video and they need to go back and they have a question about something you said, um, they don't have to search through the whole video to find it. They can actually go back to the transcript, which can be pretty helpful. Um, and so um, the last truth was that video helped build connections. I found that to be true. Um, a number of my students commented to me, I didn't always require students to have video on in our synchronous classroom, um, but we always use video in smaller group settings and I use video um, in my office hours and in my individual student conferences and students seem to be um, pretty excited about the ability to connect in that way. Um, so one of the things that I plan to do this fall, um, because I will be teaching writing online, is to use video or audio and photos for virtual introductions that I'll use a discussion board for. Um, and I think I actually am going to ask my students to post two truths and a lie. 
Um, whether they do this via video or they do this with an audio recording and a picture of themselves, what I'll get from this is one, just a little bit, I'll learn a little bit about them. Um, they'll learn a little bit about each other, but I'll also have them say their names. Um, so that when we meet for the first time in our synchronous classroom, um, I won't butcher anyone's name. I think it's very important um, to pronounce people's names correctly. And so that's a great way to hear them articulate um, how, how I should pronounce their names. The other thing I plan to do this year is use a liquid syllabus, hat tip to my colleague, Rachel Smith. I'm gonna click the link and show you an example of what a liquid syllabus looks like. This is from, uh, this is Professor Torres's liquid syllabus. Um, she's at Glendale Community College. I see a liquid syllabus as a living document. She used Google Sites to create this one. I probably will use Google Sites to create mine, but it's a great way to not only introduce your course, to supplement that introduction with some videos, um, but it's also a great way to let the students know a little bit about who you are. I think this is particularly important in a classroom where you won't meet your students, or it's highly unlikely that you will meet with your students in person um, in the fall semester. And so um, you'll have these links because you'll have my slides, um, but I'm, I'm looking forward, I'm really excited actually about building my liquid syllabus. Um, and last but certainly not least, if you haven't already, I strongly encourage you to check out Small Teaching Online. Um, while it is not geared towards law teaching, there are a ton of um, tips that you can use to transition your class to an online learning environment. Um, you might be familiar with James Lang's Small Teaching. What I like about the approach is that you don't, you don't even have to read the whole book. You can go to the chap specific chapter that you're interested in and just take one or two things and making one or two small changes can really change um, your overall course. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you all for listening. Thanks, Callie, for inviting me to speak here. Um, I'd love to connect with everyone on Twitter. And so my Twitter handle is Prof Allen Tweets. Um, I'd like to hear what everyone's doing as we all get ready for the fall. Um, thank you. Oh, my gosh. That was, that was dense. And that was wonderful. Um, what, why don't we try to pick up a couple of questions that are ju just uh, as we're going along here. Um, uh, the school does not have an institutional Prezi license. Do students have to buy a license? I think the answer is no, if they're just viewing your stuff, right? Right. They don't have to buy a license to view. And I think it's 60, I pay for mine, it's $60 a year. Um, what about Prezi and disability accommodations? Do you know anything about that? No, I, I don't. I don't. Other than, yeah, I don't. Other than I know some of their their automatic transcript features, but I have no idea how it works with a reader or I actually don't know that. Got it. Do you have students do videos before the first class or? So this will be my first time doing it, but yes, um, I saw in the William and Mary presentations uh, the idea of a class zero. So something that happens even before your actual class happens. Um, and I plan to use class zero for those introductions that students will have posted in advance and also to introduce the tech routine for my class. And if there's one takeaway I got was the word liquid syllabus, which uh, a couple of people asked about. And so I immediately Googled it and found three or four awesome articles about it. But do you, do you want to try to do, uh, flesh that out a little bit more? What, what, what's a liquid syllabus? Um, so it's essentially a website. I think of it as a living document. It's, um, you know, it's something that is more alive than a traditional syllabus. Um, it allows you to incorporate video, audio, um, and so and images um, in a way that I think just a plain text document does not. Um, something that might be particularly helpful in an environment where you won't meet your students in person. And yes, if you Google liquid syllabus, there's a ton of information. I haven't made one before, so I'm, I'm excited about um, jumping into that for this fall. All right. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Mary LaFrance, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Uh, greetings to everyone from sunny Las Vegas, where it is currently 105 degrees. Uh, but uh, I'm inside where it's nice and cool, and I'm in my uh, newly created home classroom, uh, as you can see. Um, I uh, was uh, teaching uh, two courses this past spring that were 
somewhat traditional uh, casebook oriented courses um, with relatively heavy reading assignments and uh, semi-Socratic style uh, discussions uh, happening in the classroom. Uh, then we got about a week's notice uh, to uh, switch to remote teaching. Uh, so um, one of my colleagues, uh, several of my colleagues offered us crash courses in Zoom and WebEx. Uh, and both of these were completely new to me. Uh, so I have to say that the classes were something of a blur. Uh, I really had a hard time uh, absorbing all of that information uh, under, under such time constraints. Uh, and even after I went back and uh, took more lessons and went through the recordings, I still had some serious doubts as to whether I'd be able to continue my class uh, the way I normally would uh, using either one of these uh, tools. Uh, the students were quite traumatized, of course. It was a very stressful time. Uh, some of them did not have great internet connections. Uh, many of them had sick family members or, or may have been sick themselves. Lots of them had school children at home because the schools shut down quite uh, suddenly. Uh, lots of them had financial stresses and job losses and uh, so they were just not in a very good frame of mind for traditional Socratic style classroom teaching. And nor was I in a particularly good frame of mind either. I felt pretty traumatized and stressed and had serious doubts about whether I could uh, carry on a decent class uh, using either one of these platforms. Uh, so I just did not feel comfortable uh, going ahead uh, with uh, normal uh, uh, discussion style cl classes on either Zoom or WebEx. Uh, so what I decided to do instead was to create uh, PowerPoints with pre-recorded audio and post those uh, for my students. Um, and this was also a lot of work because I don't use PowerPoints as a general rule. So for each class, I had to create the PowerPoints uh, under time constraints uh, and then do the audio recordings uh, and get them posted uh, in time uh, for each uh, class. Um, uh, I did feel that I would be able to perform better and it might help my students uh, to access the material better. Uh, I knew I could perform better because uh, the whole situation was so traumatic and I was feeling so stressed uh, that I knew if I pre-recorded the lectures, then no matter how I was actually feeling, I could fake it pretty well. So I would finish up the PowerPoints, uh, usually in the evening, but I wouldn't do the recording until the next morning. Uh, and I would wake up feeling relatively energetic. And so I could sound enthusiastic and upbeat. And sometimes I kind of went almost into a storytelling mode, almost like I was reading stories to my uh, students. Uh, and that helped, I think, uh, helped make the pre-recorded uh, PowerPoints um, more uh, pleasant for the students uh, to absorb. Uh, it also enabled the students to access the uh, classes on their own schedule, uh, the benefit, of course, of asynchronous uh, teaching, and they could stop and start them if they had interruptions or distractions, and they could go back and revisit them um, whenever they wanted to. And I also posted the PowerPoints separately uh, in case they just wanted to go back and review uh, a few pages of the PowerPoint uh, without uh, uh, going back to the pre-recorded uh, lecture. Um, so I was actually surprised at the end of the semester when I got my evaluations and I found that the students actually really liked the pre-recorded PowerPoints. Um, I was pleasantly surprised because I had no idea how they, how they would go over. Um, I do think that uh, they appreciated that it was accessible to them on their own schedules uh, and that the material was organized and I tried to present it in a way that was engaging and not monotonous. Um, 
I did, however, want to make sure that they really engaged with the reading material because these are reading intensive traditional casebook classes. Uh, so uh, before they could access the PowerPoint for each class, uh, they had to submit answers to several questions that I posted for them that were based on the readings. Uh, and uh, these were not graded, uh, but they had to submit answers in order to get credit for class attendance on that day. And they had to submit the answers before the PowerPoint became available. I did not want them to gloss over the reading and just rely on the PowerPoints for their learning. Um, some of the questions were pretty easy to answer if you did the reading. Others were more in the nature of hypotheticals that required them to synthesize what they had learned and address a, a novel situation. So it was a lot like the questions that I would ask uh, during class. Um, and uh, as I said, they were ungraded, uh, but uh, in order to receive credit, credit for class attendance, they had to answer them on a good faith, best efforts uh, basis. Uh, I also thought that these, question would help, these questions would help them figure out whether they were getting what they needed to get out of the reading material. Um, the, um, there was one uh, student uh, on his evaluation or her evaluation uh, who complained about the, these questions and said they felt, he, he or she felt I was not treating them as adults by making them answer these questions based on the reading. I actually don't uh, take that criticism too seriously because these are the same kind of questions that I would ask in the classroom if we were having a live question and answer session. Um, also, at one point during the semester, I had a student email me after the uh, PowerPoint lecture uh, to say she wasn't uh, quite sure, still wasn't quite sure of the answer to one of the hypotheticals I posed even after she had done the PowerPoint. So then we had an email exchange to make sure she, she understood. Um, so I, I was glad to hear from that student uh, and to see that she had thought about the question and she wanted to make sure that she did have the correct understanding. Uh, so I actually thought that worked uh, fairly uh, well. Um, now, the downside of this is I do feel I was spoon feeding them by giving them these carefully prepared PowerPoint lectures. And that is not something I would normally do. Uh, however, the circumstances were so exceptional uh, that I thought a little coddling was probably warranted uh, and it was probably the right strategy to help everyone get through uh, the semester. I did use Zoom a few times uh, and I did learn something from my best experiences with Zoom. Uh, my best experiences were when uh, one person was hosting the Zoom session and the other was the speaker. Uh, in a few instances, I hosted a guest speaker in my class. Uh, and in, on one occasion, I was a guest speaker for a professor at another law school. Uh, what I liked about these sessions was the presenter could just focus on the content and making eye contact with the students, and the host could follow uh, the questions that were coming up on chat or uh, look for raised hands. Because personally, I find it impossible to do both. I cannot focus on uh, speaking with the students uh, and making eye contact uh, and also uh, keep looking to see what's happening on chat or looking for raised questions. It's like trying to pat my head and rub my stomach at the same time. Some people can do it. I'm not so good at it. Uh, so uh, I think if you can arrange co-teaching or arrange to have a teaching assistant who can uh, follow chat and uh, raised hands for you, I think that would be uh, a good use uh, of Zoom. Uh, now in the summer, I'm taking all these online classes uh, on how to teach online and I am feeling overwhelmed. And so I'm experiencing it from the student perspective. And one thing that is overwhelming is I am getting a constant barrage of notifications that I have this or that assignment due, or I'm supposed to post something in a discussion or respond to somebody else's discussion post or do a peer review. And I can't even keep track of which assignments I've completed and which ones I have yet to do. It's just too much and it's overwhelming. 
Uh, and it is tempting to just stop participating. Uh, and so I think sometimes this might be too much for the students too, if they're getting poked and prodded all the time to do a lot of different things. Uh, in our survey uh, that our school took, uh, we found that um, uh, one thing the students did not like was that all the professors were using different technologies and different platforms. So every time a student had to go to class, they had to uh, remember what platform it was on and deal with all these different technologies. So keeping it simple uh, and streamlined seems to be uh, more student friendly. Um, I learned that as a student and that's supported by the survey that my school did. Um, another, uh, some other things we learned from our survey, uh, some students did not like uh, Zoom sessions um, because it was, they didn't have good connections or you know, it didn't fit their schedule uh, and they couldn't participate in the live discussion and it was not as good if they could just, just had to rely on the recording afterward. Uh, but other students did not particularly like the asynchronous assignments. They preferred the live class discussions. Uh, so there was no consensus on this. Um, the one thing there was consensus on was the students liked breakout sessions. So my colleagues who used breakout sessions for their larger classes uh, got lots of expressions of praise and gratitude from the students. So I think that's a really important thing uh, to remember. Um, uh, definitely, if you're going to do Zoom sessions, um, uh, even if you're not doing breakout sessions, uh, you definitely want to record and post those Zoom sessions because not every student is going to have a good connection uh, at the right time to attend your class live, uh, or they may have other uh, distractions. Uh, another thing that we learned from our survey about asynchronous assignments is that it's really important to pay attention to how much time the students have to spend to complete those asynchronous assignments. Some students reported that uh, the amount of time they spent doing the asynchronous assignments added up to more time than they would have spent in the classroom during uh, a normal week. So I think we have to be really considerate and thoughtful about how much time we're asking them to spend on the asynchronous assignments. If we are overwhelming them in one class, then they might uh, give short shrift to another professor's class. Uh, or they might just feel so overwhelmed that they just stop doing the work, get disengaged and give up. And we certainly don't want that uh, to happen. Uh, so uh, from these experiences of what have I learned from my fall planning? Well, I'm hoping that I don't wind up teaching uh, online for a long time in the future. I'm hoping this is temporary. So I don't want my class to be too different from the way it normally would be. Um, there are so many options for asynchronous uh, teaching, um, uh, teaching assignments. I totally uh, agree that you need to pick carefully among the different tools that are out there and pick the ones that are right for you. Um, there's a, a, just an overwhelming uh, array of choices. Uh, I am going to do 50% uh, asynchronous and 50% live Q&A discussions, which I'll host here in my home classroom. For my asynchronous assignments, I am, for the most part, going to use Cali lessons because I am familiar with those. I know there are lots of them in my field. I know they've been uh, quality controlled. They've been subject to peer review, editing. So I know they're going to be relatively uh, glitch free. I don't usually use them for teaching, but I have recommended them to my students in the past when they have been asking me how to review for exams. And the students who have followed my advice and used Cali lessons to review for exams have come back to me afterwards and told me that the Cali lessons were really helpful. So that's going to be my primary tool for the asynchronous assignments. Uh, so uh, my plan is basically hybrid. Uh, Mondays, in effect, will be asynchronous. Um, they will have reading assignments for the week. They will have Cali lessons uh, to complete by a certain deadline uh, before our live Q&A session on Wednesday. Uh, they uh, must successfully complete the Cali lesson uh, before the Wednesday discussion if they want to receive class attendance for that week. And in order to pass the class, they will have to uh, submit all the, all the Cali lessons uh, by the end of the semester. Um, the Cali, Cali lessons, of course, will be ungraded um, but I do believe that completing them successfully 
would be a really good way to reinforce what the students uh, have uh, done in their uh, reading. And I think it will set them up really nicely for the Q&A sessions on Wednesdays. I think they will have uh, more confidence in the material and will be able to have uh, a much more successful uh, Q&A session uh, that way. Um, uh, what, what is the downside here? I am, I'm reconciling myself to the likelihood that I will have to cover less material than I ordinarily would during a semester. So I am in the process of whittling down my syllabus to something that I think is doable. Um, I don't think we can cover as uh, many cases uh, because ordinarily when I have the uh, twice a week interaction with the students, I can gauge in person how their understanding is. Uh, and we can plow through a lot more material. Uh, this, in this arrangement, they're going to be self-teaching a lot more, and I have to focus more on reinforcing uh, their knowledge rather than adding new knowledge. So I'm going to have to cut down on the number of cases I cover for a particular topic. Uh, also, I may have to cut a few topics uh, altogether. Um, I think that uh, this is uh, a necessary sacrifice uh, in order to have the semester be successful. Uh, and it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make uh, in order to make sure that the students actually are successful in being able to learn the most important parts of the material. Uh, so that's what I have. Uh, back to you, John. <laughs> Thank you. Oh man, so many questions, uh, good ones too. Uh, but the one that seems to be rising the most, multiple people asked, is um, what what function or feature of your LMS do you use such that people have to that that you know that people have answered quiz questions before they before you have the reveal of the PowerPoint uh, uh, audio? Do you know, do you understand what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. I don't. I didn't use anything um, special uh, for that. And um, if there's a way do it I'd love to know um, I basically just reminded them that you have to submit your answers before uh, the starting time for class because that's when the PowerPoint would become available I just used twin uh, uh, that's what I'm familiar with and I would schedule the PowerPoint to pop up at class time and I would tell them that you have to have submitted your answers by then and I can go and check and I can see when you submitted your answers uh -huh. and it didn't submit them until after class started, you don't get class attendance for that day. Wow. <laughs> so uh, I, w I do want to remind people, there are ways to do that in most modern LMSs. I know that for sure in Blackboard and Canvas and Moodle. Um, uh, and, and there's even, I think, an ability in Twend to sort of turn on a time or put a time thing on something. I might be wrong. Twend is the one I'm least familiar with, but. But that's certainly a capability in most LMSs. Um, all right. I'm still dismissing all those questions about that. Um, did you have a choice uh, as to synchronous or asynchronous, or, or did, your, did your school decide that? Um, they basically let us all make our own decisions. So yeah, I had, a, I had complete discretion. Awesome. All right. Um, and, and a few people asking about your setup, your camera and your uh, uh, whatever it is, your, your technical setup. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, um, I, I got an external uh, web. Uh, a lot of them are sold out online, so I got mine secondhand off eBay. Uh, it's a <laughs> Logitech, Logitech C930E. I got that because it has uh, a 90 degree lift and my uh, whiteboard is an eight foot panel. And uh, depending on how I position the camera, I can cover the entire width of the whiteboard. So uh, cameras usually come with, I don't know, 90 degrees or 78 degrees or something less. Uh, and I wanted the widest possible um, field of vision. Uh, so that's the Logitech C930E. Um, we'll, we'll get it in the show notes for sure, yeah, the session yeah. notes. Uh, my whiteboard uh, is uh, uh, just a hardboard panel from Lowe's. It costs less than 15 bucks. It's not even permanently attached to my wall. It's sitting up on chairs and stacks of books. 
uh, and leaning against the wall. So it's at a slight angle, but it still works. Yeah, Mary, it, it was it was the gun that wasn't fired that you're standing in front of a whiteboard and you and you didn't use it. <laughs> well, you know, it didn't really need any bullet points. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I just I just have to remember to make sure I use the thick thick part of the marker, right? Make sure my letters are nice and thick. So I have to practice on that a little bit. Um, but I'm only going to use it for class discussions because when students make a good point during class discussions, I think most of us, are, our instinct is to put it on the whiteboard, right? Okay, that's an important point. Let's think about that. Or we'll get back to that in a minute. Or, you know, what are the different possibilities? Let's on the board and go back about them. So, you know, it, it keeps the Q&A going in that organic fashion, but it keeps us focused so we don't lose track of points. So I don't have to use the whiteboard a lot. Lot, uh, which is why something fairly primitive and cheap, I think, is going to work just fine. Um, and uh, it was easy, easy enough to set up. I think the hardest part is lighting. You can see a little bit of glare on the whiteboard. Um, I have, uh, I'm using just about every spare lamp that I have in the house. Uh, I'm surrounded by uh, lighting fixtures, which makes it a little bit warm. Um, but uh, glare turned out not to be as bad as I feared it would be. Uh, so that's uh, basically my setup. I actually do um, uh, have a lavalier mic uh, that I'm going to use uh, uh, so that I don't have to teach in my teacher voice like I am right now. I'd like to be able to speak more quietly like, like if I'm talking to someone in office hours. So um, I've got a lavalier, but uh, I need an external speaker in order to use the lavalier, so I, I haven't finished getting that all set up yet. Very good. How do, how do you do you do you use lesson link or some other method to know that the students have completed their tally lessons? Well, I haven't started using them yet, so I, I'm going to have to figure that out. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm I'm sure that you and Deb Paul's will guide maybe. me. Absolutely. Um. Um. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let me see if we can find one more. Do you do you have any guidelines for determining uh, the amount of time that a task will take students to complete? Um, this uh, uh, Deanna is confessing that she constantly underestimates the time. Um, you know, and can see it's a big issue for for overloading students. Yeah, I think that, that we all have difficulty figuring out how long it takes our students to complete something. Because for us, it's easy. Either we created the assignment or we know the material so well uh, that um, it, it seems like it should be something you could do really quickly. So I think we all have that problem. Uh, nice thing about Cali lessons is they come with their own time estimates. Um, so that's, to me, one of, the, one of the advantages of using a Cali lesson uh, for other assignments I really don't know how to make the time very good thank you Mary all right Brittany it's time for Brittany to 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 take the floor sure thank you so much and just let's start um, this up um, so thank you to Callie for having me um, I am going to talk about the transition to uh, online learning with a seminar, uh, which is a little bit different, I think, than what we've talked about so far. Um, and then I will also talk about my experiences moving online with a seminar. And then I am teaching a seminar uh, this summer. So I already used some of the lessons uh, already for this summer that I learned from the transition. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the seminar that I teach and the kind of characteristics that we think about um, when we teach in-person seminars and how we can potentially preserve those characteristics when we move to online. Um, how I tried to when I abruptly switched to online, what I learned from doing it online, and then finally, um, how I think we can set up good um, seminars online. So I teach a seminar at the law school called Reproductive Rights and Justice. Um, it looks at, it's, it, well, first it's very discussion based. It's not very doctrinal based. It's not Socratic. 
Um, it's very non-traditional in terms of a law school type setting or a law school classroom that we think about. Um, we analyze uh, the history of reproductive justice reprodu and women's and individuals' reproductive health, um, looking at it through a critical race lens, a queer lens, a socioeconomic and justice theory lens, um, and then look at other issues in relation to reproduction. So as you can imagine, it was, it's always when it's in person, it's a round table discussion. Um, it's very conversational based um, and it's very personal. And so I think one of the things that we think about when we move online is we lose some of that personal, right? And so we instead then feel robotic, I think John said in the beginning of this, or we feel like we lack that personal or intimate nature sometimes that a seminar um, can bring. And so the benefit of having seminars at law school in law school, I think, is that it allows students to think about the law and really talk about it um, and really apply it to social problems like I do in my class. Um, there's typically a lot of engagement in seminars. There's a lot of personal connection. Um, it's a smaller class size. Um, typically, when we have the round table, we're all in a circle. Um, group discussion is really comfortable. There's no awkward, like, should I speak? Should I not speak? What's my cue when I can speak? Um, it's very less traditional and there's no final exam. So, I mean, in my course this summer, I'm doing a, a little bit of an argument in a final paper. Um, but otherwise, it's very non-traditional. So all of these things that I've already been saying of the characteristics of a seminar, already online learning objectively just looks like we can't preserve those things. We can't have personal connection or we can't have comfortable discussion um, because social cues might not be there, right? Like we might not be able to know when it's okay to speak. Do we just start talking out loud in our homes? What if I'm talking over someone else? Um, it's not as easy. And so, when we moved online uh, because of COVID-19, it forced us to obviously to move into emergency online instruction and there was a week to prepare to move classes online. And so to be honest, I panicked and thought, how can I preserve the characteristics of a seminar online uh, on Zoom, which is the platform that I use. And so I, I really questioned, you know, how am I going to do this? And similarly to the other presenters today, um, you know, in that week's time, we were trained on electronic platforms and we were trained on kind of technological issues, but I don't think necessarily we were really thinking about at the time because of the short amount of time um, and kind of the urgency to move online. We weren't thinking about social presence en enough at that time and how could we? So social presence to me in online learning environments refers to the degree to which a learner, like the student obviously, feels personally connected with other students in the room and the instructor. Um, and creating a social presence online is something that I was most worried about. So what I did before the class moved online in that week period we had to prepare, I surveyed my students and asked, what are you worried about with our class going online? And this is something that I'm going to do for my fall classes because I am personally teaching online in the fall as well. Um, it's something I did in the summer. Um, I am also, uh, I also gave a survey to my students who I was teaching in the summer online and I asked them to tell me what their worries were. And I got a lot of results and so, Students for my seminar were worried that it was going to feel more lecture based like I was going to have to talk out the talk at that at them more rather than having a discussion. Um, they were worried about it feeling impersonal. Um, they were worried it would be awkward and it would create this awkwardness of when do I speak. When do I not. I'm not sure. Um, they didn't know a lot of them. This is a very common comment. I'm not sure when it's going to be okay to speak or interject a thought. Um, and then a lot of them were concerned because it was it's a very personal class and it's very I work with them one on one on their writing skills as well. And they were worried about not being able to just open, you know, come into my open door in my office um, and really work with me anymore. So when we moved online um, in the short amount of time that I had to move online, I did change some things. Um, and so when we were in person, we would discuss the case law, we would discuss legal theory, but then we would discuss the issues. Um, and we would apply those issues to society today. And we would try to come up with ways to solve some of the injustices. Um, and so online, I pretty much did it in the same way. We just did it live on Zoom. 
Um, and so we had online group discussions and then I set up a forum so students could continue participating in the discussion and it's mandatory that a student at least post twice on each forum discussion question. Um, I set up electronic one on one meetings and then I found myself having to give them more written feedback since I wasn't there in person to help them one on one as much um, or sometimes the students weren't comfortable asking for an online meeting and particularly you know many of our students were sick with COVID or their family members were sick so the difficulty with one-on-one -on -one meeting and scheduling was present um, and then uh, we did oral arguments in the um, in this past in the one that I taught in the spring um, because they were half of the class was arguing to overturn Roe versus Wade and the other one was arguing to not overturn Roe versus Wade um, and we were going to mimic in person this courtroom type style to, to finalize and finish off the semester. And of course we couldn't do it in person, but I did, I used a webinar feature where on the screen was the two students arguing in the judges panel and then the students were pan, were attendees, similar to what's, what's happening now. Um, so I kind of did it abruptly and honestly didn't change much because of the short amount of time. Um, and I kind of just took us in the classroom and put us online um, and expected the discussion to be the same. Um, but discussion honestly wasn't as lively um, and it wasn't as engaging as it was in person. And so I, it really made me realize that one of, I think, the major challenges of online learning is that the teacher and the learners, right, they are in different places. So now they're in completely different places and it creates the potential for students to feel a lack of social connection with the professor and the students. So I realized this for seminars especially. So social interaction with the professor and the other learners in the room was is really instrumental to a seminar. It's instrumental in motivating the learner's efforts to learn and to engage and it does promote satisfaction with an online course. And so, like I said, I think much literature and discussion centers around, um, you know, instructional design and technological features when we're moving online and not a lot on social presence. So I learned a lot when I moved to emergency online instruction and immediately thought before my summer class starts, I need to research and and really come up with ways to create a greater social presence and connection um, in the classroom. So what I started doing for summer then was created some policies. So I always ask students to have their video on. A lot of students I noticed when we abruptly moved to online learning, they had their videos off. Um, and I teach a very small class. It had 12 people before and now I have 14. Um, and so seeing everyone on the screen was not overwhelming as having like a 100 person class. Um, I asked them to mute when not speaking so we can kind of create an environment where it was easy to focus. Um, I asked them to raise their hand in Zoom to enter into the discussion queue to try to eliminate some of the awkwardness and then Zoom ca categorizes them in the order they raise their hand. Um, now I use breakout rooms a lot, which I'll talk about a little in a minute. Um, and then I require participation in the forum still to continue discussion. Um, and then I did increase this summer um, class participa participation in their final grade. So I increased the amount of points um, class par participation um, is afforded. So the lessons that I learned really helped me develop the seminar for this summer. And I think they will help me develop develop the, my courses moving forward if they are ever online. I think that there was a need to create a stronger social presence in the online learning environment, making students more comfortable with it, not only with the online platform and that they're comfortable with the technological features, but that they're comfortable with me um, and speaking to me and with the students in the classroom and that they felt an almost like an interpersonal connection to everyone in the class. And then I, I wanted to increase the amount of social connection between the students and the professor and with each other as a result of that. Um, so I wanted to make sure that the students were going to be talking a lot to me um, in the sessions and in classes, but also talking a lot to each other. And then I also wanted them, you know, similarly to work together to, to build their own little online community. So I wanted, I didn't want my class to stop at the class. I wanted students to continue working together outside of my class so then they would continuously feel comfortable in my seminar talking to each other and participating. And then finally, I noticed and learned that 
there really is a need for more feedback and communication with students about their progress. I think that just because they aren't in our buildings anymore, they never know or are always questioning how they're doing. So um, in the, this summer now, I'm incorporating a lot more feedback, not only on their progress on their written assignments or anything like that, but just on their level of discussion and communication and, and how they're really comprehending uh, the material. So all of those things and all of those lessons I learned forced or, or had me create this. Um, and this is adding so much more than I did when we moved to emergency online instruction. Um, I use breakout rooms all of the time. Um, students love them. Um, and so, yeah, I only have a class of 14 students, but I pose questions to the students and then I put them in small groups of two or three each and they each share and have a discussion with each other. And then when we come as a large class, each group then discusses what they discuss. Um, students that increased the level of participation like tenfold um, from when we went emergency online instruction. Students love the pair and share. It's almost like they are working with the students in the group individually before they share to the rest of the students. It makes them more comfortable um, and it really has them engage more. Um, in breakout rooms too, a lot of times I'll, I'll break them into two sections or four sections. Um, just this Monday, um, we were arguing, um, you know, half of the class represented husband, half of the class represented wife and who owns the embryos. So they were in breakout rooms. Uh, one side representing husband, one side representing wife, and then we came as a class to argue. Um, the participation, like I said, was tenfold. Um, and then sometimes I'll just break them into smaller groups to answer discussion questions themselves. And then I will enter each group and engage in their discussion on a smaller scale. Um, and then we won't come back and share as a class, we'll move on to a different topic. So. I always too have students work with different students in the class. So each student is always engaging with the entirety of their class just in different ways and engaging with me. I think that the use of breakout rooms and parent share and having them formulate arguments and then argue against each other really, really made or is making for a tremendous discussion. And it really makes it feel again like it's a seminar, even though it is online. So I also use the poll feature. You all were exposed to that um, today with the Zoom polling. I do the same thing. Um, after each class, I ask them um, how the class made them feel today in because we deal with heavy subject matter. Um, and so um, I ask them how the class made them feel that day sometimes. Um, I'll always ask them if they're comfortable with the material on a level of you know high, medium, low. Um, and so if I know that we need to keep reviewing something because something that we're missing, I think, from being online are those faces. Like it's easy to see faces of confusion um, in person, but it's not as easy online. So I'm constantly polling them and asking them, how's it going? Um, are you following with the material? Are you, are you uh, engaging in the discussion the way you want to be? Um, and also, is the online platform, do you have any suggestions? I'm constantly asking the student, what could work better if something's not working? I'm involving them in their learning and um, they're liking it a lot. I think it, it creates and just further creates that personal connection. And so then um, I created virtual office hours. So I use Zoom for those and I set up the waiting room feature. Um, and I let students into my office in the order they enter the waiting room. So that allows me to still work one on one with students. It would just like be it would be just like dropping into my office hours um, instead of waiting outside of my door. You're just waiting in the waiting room on zoom um, and students love those. So it You know, students come to either further the discussion that we had in class or maybe for writing support one on one. And then something that I also did is that I started um, incorporating asynchronous methods. So instead of just talking to them about the law and balking at them about it, um, like I did when we went um, on emergency uh, or, or in emergency online teaching, now I pre-record something. So like, for example, I pre-recorded a history of Roe versus Wade that they had to watch before coming to class. Classroom time is just for discussion um, and no longer to really talk about doctrine. The students really liked that. Um, so when we moved to emergency online instruction, I would talk to them about the law for a first chunk of class, and then I would, then we would have a discussion. So now um, I just record anything that I want them to watch prior, and then we just use class time for discussion. 
And then I also set up virtual study groups for the students. Um, and so I set up the study groups myself. I told them that if they want to switch groups or, you know, do whatever, um, they could. But the students, and it's been working, right? So the students meet once a week outside of the classroom to work on their briefs that they have to write for my class. Um, and just to continue their conversation about the material, um, I set them up through Zoom through our library. And I'm not really sure how that works. If you want more information on that, I can get it. Um, but Again, I think it's just something that created those personal connections, that, that comfort, um, and the, the willingness to feel like a seminar. And then something else that I definitely noticed that I had to do was give immediate meaningful feedback in a forum. So I had my students post in discussion forums in the spring, but you know most students wouldn't really reply, or sometimes I wouldn't. There was so much going on in the spring, not only uh, you know, preparing for online instruction, but I'm also the director of bar support. And as many of on this call know, the bar exam was a little bit in flux. So I found myself not really acknowledging a lot of the posts, um, which is detrimental. So one of the things that you, I think all professors should do if we have discussion posts or forums is that you have to acknowledge the posts. Acknowledging them and, and commenting on them makes them feel seen, it makes them feel heard, um, and it will, it will force them or, or create the, the desire to engage even more. And then finally, I, I just note, it noted the importance to create safe uh, online spaces. So where everyone was comfortable, where everyone had an open mind, and where everyone respected one another. So I started the class in the seminar by, by talking about difference in opinion. I mean, it's reproductive justice, so it's a, it could be a controversial topic. Um, and we talked about what we knew about reproductive justice coming in. Um, I had everyone share a personal story or, and the question was along the lines of, how have you ever encountered a reproductive justice injustice, whether it was you, a family member, or something you watched on TV or a reading. And I found that everyone kind of sharing personal stories, opening up to one another, um, a discussion about having an open mind and respect really made students feel comfortable. So I can't, stress enough how well the seminar is going this summer um, in conjunction to the emergency remote star and all of these uh, all of these pieces I think really are making it successful. And then I just wanted to put some things that I think maybe we all I think as educators should consider when we're moving online seminar or not. Um, always remember your out and outline your learning objectives make sure they're still present online. Um, obviously test your content and technology early. Um, and then I would stress point three, which is something that I'm really working on and I, and I wanna talk to my law school about so we can work on as a whole is not just focusing on technology and instructional design, but consider how to foster social presence, um, make students feel that interpersonal connection that they're not getting because they're not in the classroom. And then finally, just to consider how the transition opens up new opportunities. Honestly, the breakout room feature for me created opportunities that I didn't have in the classroom. It, it really allowed students to work together on a smaller scale and more intimately than in the classroom where I didn't really have that opportunity because conversations collide. Um, and so there are opportunities moving to online and if we can start picturing them in that way, then I think it would just help us create um, our classes. But that is all I have. That was great, Brittany. Thank you very much. So many questions um, <laughs> and questions for all of you. And we have time for questions, which is wonderful. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bite into a meaty one first. Um, you, you, you said you wanted to, uh, I don't know if you said you required your students to turn their cameras on, but you, but how do you balance the, 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 the requesting or requiring the, of, of cameras on with the, the students who are in uh, uh, apartments with kids or homes or or other other reasons why they wouldn't want to turn their cameras on. And this is not just a question for you, but for all of you. Yeah, so for me, one of the things, I do tell students if they absolutely don't feel comfortable, they don't, they don't have to. I just ask that they um, put their picture um, because you can put your picture on Zoom. Um, if not, um, I think that I've created or I think I've created a comfortable enough space where sometimes the children are attending class on the laps of the student. Um, and I, I think that's okay. 
So I, I let them know um, that if I see a pet or a child or a parent or anything, please don't worry about it. And I think it's all about making the student feel comfortable. But I do say, you know, I would never force someone or make it mandatory. That's just me. Um, but I strongly encourage it and try to make them feel as comfortable as possible. Very good. And Renee, I, I think I think you said something about people using um, Institute or or other avatars as a as a uh, a proxy to uh, to replace their their videos if they wanted to, right? Yeah, I'm trying to be more flexible. I think one of the things that worked well for me is um, I use WebEx training, and so the way that's set up, you don't get the grid view, so cameras aren't really cameras on for everyone isn't that meaningful. Um, but um, for our last class, our last two classes, I used WebEx meeting, which allows you to have the grid view kind of like what you see in Zoom. Um, but I gave them advance notice of that. So um, everyone knew. And, and again, I would have been forgiving if, if no one, you know, if people didn't want to appear on it, but everyone knew that it was coming. So it wasn't a surprise. Very good. So just some quick technical questions. Um, uh, and if people... I'm going to go ahead. Oh, um, in the in the spring, I did not require them to turn their cameras on. Uh, in in the fall, I will encourage them to, but I'm not going to require it because I'm sure there'll be days that people just don't want to be seen, and that's okay. I get that. All right. So, just some quick uh, qu quick tech questions. Um, uh, what LMS were you using, Prof um, uh, Brittany? in your class? Um, yeah, so uh, we use, and I don't know if it's common everywhere, I think it's an institutional design. It's called Bridges. So it's like a, it's like a canvas, but it's Bridges. And I think it's, it's unique to our university. I, th I think other universities might use it, um, but it's a, it was a system that was created in, institutionally, I think. All right. It has, all three same, it has the same format and it has a, for it has a forums tab. Good. What, what platform did you all use for recording lectures and where did you post your recordings? Um, Renee, I thought you said uh, you I used Prezi. Oh, go ahead. I recorded mine on, um, just on uh, PowerPoint and then uh, I had someone on our staff uh, convert them to a format that um, was accepted by TWIN because TWIN would not accept uh, PowerPoints with audio. So I, I don't remember what they converted them to to put them on twin because it is very low capacity. Probably MP4s, yeah, which is what YouTube is. Okay. Um, so yes, I use Prezi. Um, Prezi allows you to share with a link. And so I just, I posted the links to all of the Prezi's on our, on Blackboard Ultra on our course page. Yeah, and I just recorded um, on Zoom. Even if it was a pre-recording, I just played it like I was presenting to someone and recording it and then uploaded it as an MP4 to our course page. Very good, all right. Uh... And someone kind of asked with the recording of my class, um, someone asked if it was confidential. Uh, I asked the students beforehand if they would feel comfortable with me recording it or not because of the nature of the class. Um, and they all wanted the class recorded. So I, I don't know if I would have done that if a student was uncomfortable with it, but because they were all um, on board and all wanted it recorded, I did. Yeah, that could be that could be that could be dicey for for all for all of this with so much recording of classes. Um, I imagine Supreme Court uh, justice hearings in the future were going to be interesting. Uh, how much uh, when, when when students were waiting in the waiting room? You know, um, and let's say it was taking a long time with the particular student. Is there a way to pop in and say to them, this is going to take a few minutes or something like that? Yeah, so you can actually chat the waiting room. So I always had a message that said, thanks for waiting. Um, uh, you'll be entered into the room in the order you came in currently with a student, but looking forward to talking to you soon. And I'd make sure I would just copy and paste that message like every five minutes or every 10 minutes. Good. So a uh, question for all of you, how long does it take to plan? The question is exactly this, how long does it take to plan a lesson? Um, I think the bigger question is, 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 is how much effort do faculty have to put into preparing, you know, a class and a course uh, for the fall? I think a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, rather, rather you're honest with them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like I would say, so I'm currently preparing for the fall. Um, but I'm also, you know, preparing the students for the bar. So, um, I've got like a dual role. Um, but I would say that it, it's going to take a sufficient amount of hours. If I had to guess, it, I wouldn't be surprised in saying that every week in the summer, 30 hours a week to planning for the fall would be extreme. I think that would be realistic. Yeah, I'm a over, I probably spend way too much time planning for my class anyway, so uh, I'm probably not the right person to ask this question to. I've always used Prezi slides and I put a ton of time into them and I rarely reuse them from year to year. Um, but I will say that, you know, if you are someone who is um, preoccupied by the sound of your own voice and it annoys you like the sound of my voice annoys me, then that makes the recordings, the video, the audio, I think take a ton of time because I want them to sound perfect. And I, they don't have to sound perfect, but I just, you know, if I trip over one word and I know that I can do it all again because I'm recording it, then I, I probably would do it all again. Um, it's the type A, I guess, in me. But um, I have not yet started preparing for the fall, but I, I plan to transition um, from writing um, to prep in mid-June and it probably is going to take me six weeks or so to have at least the first half of the semester together. So um, in the spring when I did the pre-recorded PowerPoints that did take a lot of time because I had not used PowerPoints before so I had to create them from scratch for both of my classes um, with, with you know, no advanced time to prepare. So that, that was really time consuming and it does take a while to do the audio recordings, although I found I got better at it uh, as time went on and, and I was able to do them more quickly. In terms of overall planning for the fall, uh, I, I've already started doing a lot of that and I just try to do a little bit every day uh, so I won't be all stressed and panicked uh, at the end of July or beginning of August. So I don't really know in total how much time I'm putting into it. But uh, I feel like if I start early, then I'll have more time to deal with obstacles uh, or make decisions. And like one of the toughest decisions is what am I gonna cut out of the syllabus? Uh, so I'm gonna be you know, whittling down my syllabus gradually over the next month or so. Cool, all right, um, two more questions. Uh, and and one, one of them is sort of the balance question. People saying if you're if you're giving them Cali lessons or if you're giving them pre-recorded videos, um, and you kind of touched on it, Mary, just a second ago, you know, are you reducing the amount that you're that you're going to teach? I mean, or or how do you decide how to balance or or create a course that covers the same amount of material if you if you're adding material? Um, anybody want to pick up, pick that one up? Well, I'll, I'll start since I, I talked about it already. Yes, um, I I discovered you know, about a week ago, I, I accepted the uh, reality that I will have to cover less material um, because I'm not there to push through the material in person twice a week for 85 minutes per class. Uh, and for the students to self-teach, I know that is going to take longer, even with one Q&A session uh, per, uh, per week. So, um, uh, I, I do believe that uh, the learning process will take longer this way than it has in the past. All right, one one more. Unless, unless you want to jump in on, the, on that balance issue, anybody. Um, but if the question is, it's come up in, in previous sessions, I call it the lost student question. Um, how do you get students who are unmotivated to participate in discussions or what do you do if they're if they're trying to ghost the class, so to speak? And, and not, not engage, um, uh, I mean, are, are you punitive with, with grades uh, on discussions or are you um, encouraging or I don't know, what, what, what have you got for us? Uh, my plan is to post quest, uh, a number of questions in advance so they know um, the, the major questions I'm gonna ask. Uh, and I am planning to do more cold calling uh, than I have in the past. Um, one of the things that I think helps is, and I, I plan to do this a little differently in the fall, I, I usually do random group work, and um, so my breakouts in the spring were random. I think I'm going to have permanent 
uh, group assignments. So they'll, they'll know who their group members are. And I find that that accountability to the group um, kind of keeps people um, on track and engage with whatever is going on in class. Um, and I also, I also find that I hear about it when folks are not participating and, and contributing to their groups as they should be. Brittany, you get, you get last word. Yeah, so I was going to do something a lot similar. I think I'm going to increase the, the group work, honestly, because of how much positive feedback our entire university got on breakout rooms and group work. Um, so I think that that's something I'm going to do. I'm also thinking about kind of taking the medical school model and, and quizzing them before class. So before you attend the class, you have to do a quiz on the material. So I'm ensuring that they're doing the, the reading or any material before coming to class. So that's something I've been uh, looking into. Excellent. Folks, all of you, thank you so much. That was wonderful. For once, we're going to end almost on time. Oh, one minute. It just turned over. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, to the attendees, there's one more class next Tuesday. We look forward to seeing you. Stay healthy. <laughs>